Um, my name is Barry Lynn, and uh, I direct the Markets, Enterprise, and Resiliency Initiative here at New America. And I wanted to thank you all for coming today. And um, you know, we have uh, we're going to have two panels today, and it's uh, and just I'll just give you a sense about how the day will work. We'll we'll run this panel till about 1:50 or so, and then we'll also have a break. Then we'll have some co uh, coffee, and I think there might be some cookies. And uh, then we'll have a, a second panel. And um, as you probably noticed, these panels there, it's a great mix of people. I mean, uh, one of these that we have, uh, um, uh, well, actually, we'll, we'll, we'll see who they are over time. Um, but it's, a, uh, it's actually a, a big honor to have this, uh, uh, the people who are on our panels here with us today. But we're here today to talk about something that's been too long ignored in our country, which is the structure of our markets for beer and alcohol. You know, and whether sort of extreme concentration of economic power poses any kind of threat to the traditional structure of these markets. You know, and actually just to give us a sense of what we're dealing with, I thought it might be useful to travel back about 45 years, and this is to a Supreme Court case that was heard back in 1966. It was the United States versus Pabst Brewing. And what had happened there is that the Department of Justice had stopped a deal in which Pabst was going to take over a brewer called Blatt's. Now, just consider these figures. At that time, Pabst had about, was the 10th largest brewer in the United States. Blatt's was the 18th largest brewer in the United States. Combined, they would have become the fifth largest brewer in the United States, and the regulators blocked the deal. They said that this combined firm would be too powerful nationally and especially in certain localities uh, within the United States. They said that three states in particular would be really affected by this. It was Wisconsin, Illinois, and, and, and Michigan. But how much power are we talking about? This is in you know, 1966. In Wisconsin, they would have had 23.95% of the marketplace, the combined entity. In Michigan, Wisconsin, and Illinois together, they would have had 11.32% of the marketplace. Nationally, they would have had 4.49% of sales. And the government blocked that deal. And the Supreme Court upheld that action by a 9-0 vote. This is 1966. The justices also felt compelled to add a few comments when they did so. Justice Hugo Black said, these facts show a very marked 30-year decline in the number of brewers and a sharp rise in recent years in the percentage share of the market controlled by the leading brewers. If not stopped, this decline in the number of separate competitors and this rise in the share of the market controlled by the larger beer manufacturers are bound to lead to greater and greater concentration of the beer industry into fewer and fewer hands. Justice William O. Douglas, in a concurring opinion, said, every time you pick up the newspaper, you read about one company merging with another. Of course, we have laws to protect competition in the United States, but one can't help thinking that if the trend continues, the whole country will soon be merged into one large company. 30 years ago in the United States, the, when the Reagan administration first entered office, they essentially stopped enforcing antitrust law in the traditional ways, these imperfect ways that the, the uh, justices were talking about. And what they feared back in 1966, we now have today. Two firms, Anheuser-Busch InBev and Miller Coors, control Depends how you do the numbers, but if you do it certain ways, 90% of the marketplace in the United States. Two companies. Locally, in certain neighborhoods, the concentration levels are higher. These two firms have floated the idea of merging together into one firm. Yes, we have 2,000 breweries in the United States today, compared to maybe about 100 in 1966. But we have to be honest about where these 2,000 breweries, you know, how much power they actually have. 1,995 of them are squished together in about 5 to 6% of the marketplace. They're marginalized. 
There exists only at the edges of the, the marketplace. And the fact is that both ABI and Miller Coors are pushing aggressively against them. And here's just some of the names of companies, of brands that look like craft brews or small brews that are run by the big guys or owned either direct, uh, completely or partly. Red Hook, Woodmere, Goose Island, Old Dominion, Leinenkugel, Blue Moon, Shock Top, Terrapin, Rolling Rock. This is a, sort of a revolution that has taken place in this marketplace. It is part of a revolution that's taking place within the political economy of the United States. You know, of course, not all revolutions are bad, are entirely bad. And one of our, our main questions today is whether this revolution that we face here today has taken us too far or not. You know, to help us answer that, a few points before we get to our panel, a few points on these issues of I think it may help us to look at sort of the, the intersection of markets and morality. Because there's, you know, in the United States today, today, you have a lot of folks on the right who say that markets are moral. Whatever they, comes out of market interactions, that's a moral outcome. A lot of folks on the left say, whatever the markets are doing, it's immoral. We have to act, if we want to have something moral, we have to isolate it from the actions of the marketplace. I think when we look at the market that exists for beer and alcohol in the United States that was put into place 80 years ago, what we have is an instance that proves that markets are indeed moral if you make them so. Before prohibition, American society had this huge problem. You know, the alcohol interests, as they used to call them, the alcohol interests had captured the power to overwhelm the, the, the local market makers, the regulators. They had the power to push their products onto communities. They had the power to push their products across the lips of individuals. And the problem was sufficiently grave that the American people, this incredibly well-lubricated people at that time, they managed to pass a constitutional amendment prohibiting alcohol sales in the United States. I mean, that was a huge lift. That gives you a sense of how massive the problem was, how grave the problem was that they were dealing with. The experiment failed. During, you know, the result of prohibition, we know the story. The result was that we ended up with a collapse of law and order. We had a collapse of respect for, 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 uh, for government. And so people decided, well, we're going to have to abandon this experiment. So, and after prohibition, citizens had the opportunity to make markets for alcohol, for beer, entirely anew. It was a tabla rasa. And how did they do so? The citizens back in the 1930s, they established, first they established what their aims would be. And their aims were to do something very, very conservative. It was to establish the responsibility for drinking, to seed it not in the state, in the central state. It was to establish it in the community, to establish it in the individual citizen. The goal was not control. The goal was self-control. It was not controlled by the government. It was controlled by the individual. John D. Rockefeller, who funded the publication of a, a book that was very influential at that time. It's called Toward Liquor Control. In the foreword to that book wrote, men cannot be made good by force. We've learned that from this, ex this experience. So this, the point was not of these regulations. The point of this marketplace was not to force people to do anything. It was the exact opposite. So how did we achieve, how did these people achieve this aim of community responsibility, of individual responsibility, they did so first by distributing power among the states. The 21st Amendment, this is what it reads, Section 2, the transportation or importation in any state, territory, or possession of the United States for delivery or use therein of intoxicating liquors in violation of laws thereof is hereby prohibited. They also achieve their aim by distributing power among different business activities. They prevented vertical integration among the brewer, the distributor, 
and the retailer. Brewers were not allowed to own or control distributors or retailers. Distributors were not allowed to own retailers or brewers. The result was a true, diverse, vibrant marketplace, one that achieved its primary moral aims, which was to return responsibility to the community and to the individual. This new marketplace also yielded two byproducts. One of the byproducts was a little complicating for the people who were seeking to create some control, reasonable control, and this byproduct was reasonable prices. This three-tier market system was not inefficient. In fact, it was remarkably efficient, which shouldn't be surprising given that you had a bunch of small enterprises competing with each other. It was remarkably efficient. The result was low prices. So to achieve what people wanted, the balance of prices that people wanted, the communities instituted pricing controls if they wanted. They instituted taxes if they wanted. The other byproduct of the system was an incredible diversification, incredible variety of beer. The modern American craft brewing system, we believe, is a result precisely of the fact that this power to regulate was distributed so widely across America. Every state had its own hand in this. The diversity that we see just in that little 5% of the marketplace where the brewers operate, the small brewers, the craft brewers, is greater than any place else in the world. In many ways, it's greater than any other sector in the United States of America. It's a result of this marketplace that was put into place back in the 1930s. Today, we're, the, these two panels that we're hosting, you know, the first one is focusing on the interests of Americans as consumers. The people who care about greater varieties of beer, higher qualities of beer and alcohol. The second panel is going to focus on something quite different, which is the interests of society, you know, issues of health, of, of self-control. It's sort of the second panel departs from the idea, and this is a quote from uh, Dr. Uh, Babor, who's going to be uh, on the second panel, that alcohol is no ordinary commodity. That you do, you can't just sell it the way you sell socks. As I suspect we'll see from these panels, these fo the folks on both of these panels, which have very different interests, one thing they both will end up supporting is the, the three tier system local control. Two quick last points. We're not here to bash anybody. We're not here to bash any big brewers. We're not here to bash any big uh, retailers. We do not at any point intend to say that anybody is, 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 is breaking any kind of laws. People in business do what they do. I mean, their job is to go out and, and, and push the envelope. Their job is to go out and sell more stuff. That's what we expect people to do. No one is acting in any way that we want to condemn them for. What we want to shine a light on today is bad law, or especially bad enforcement of law. The fault in this lies in no big company. It lies in us, the citizenry. We, the people, have failed to perform our most fundamental moral, political, and civic duties, which is to regulate this extremely complicated set of marketplaces to ensure that no power ever becomes sufficiently great to be able to once again overwhelm local control, to overwhelm, to push alcohol into our markets, to push alcohol across our lips. The fault also lies in our elected representatives. The Obama administration should understand that sort of brewing five gallons of homebrew in the White House is not a sufficiently powerful action. If the administration is to serve the public interest, it is to do, if the administration is to do what the public elected it to do, 
It must use this power that is in that office and in the administration to assist us in reestablishing open and competitive markets again, free from domination by any private, very large companies. And the last point I want to make is this event and the report that we're releasing today is funded entirely by the New America Foundation. We have received zero funding for this, zero funding from any brewers, large or small, zero funding from any distributors, large or small. We have not received any money from any trade association. Why are we doing this? We're doing it with our own money because we believe it's the right thing to do. We believe it's the right economic thing to do, or it's the right political thing to do, and it's the right social thing to do. That's why we're holding this, this event. That's why we're promoting this discussion. We believe that this debate will serve the interest of all American citizens. Anyway, today we're going to discuss three documents. I'm uh, just going to give you a sense of what they are. The, the, uh, in the second panel, we're going to be discussing a, a recent article by uh, a writer named Tim Heffernan. Uh, this is in the Washington Monthly. The name of that article is called Last Call, Industry Giants Are Threatening to Swallow Up America's Carefully Regulated Alcohol Industry and re Make America in the Image of Booze-Soaked Britain. That piece, if you haven't seen it, you can read it on the Washington Monthly website. We're also going to be talk, uh, talking about a, a recent document uh, that was written by Sandy Vahizen. Uh, this was for the American Antitrust Institute. Uh, it's called Halting Beer's March to Monopoly, the Likely Anti-Competitive Effects of Anheuser-Busch InBev's Proposed Acquisition of Grupo Modelo. Uh, this is on the AAI website. And then we also... Uh, uh, we're just releasing right now uh, our own report, which is called A King of Beers, question mark. Concentration of power over America's alcohol markets is bad for consumers. It also imperils constitutional and moral balances. That is now available on the New America website. Um, anyway, the, what we have now is uh, uh, this panel. Um, and we're, I guess we're going to have uh, uh, the members of this panel are just to my immediate right. It's uh, Sam Calagione, who uh, some of you may uh, recognize. Uh, Sam had his, uh, a TV show for a while. He's a, the, the founder and president of Dogfish Head Brewery uh, out in, in Delaware. Uh, Sam uh, founded uh, Dogfish Head back in 1995. Um, and um, uh, brews a, a pretty good beer. And uh, the... Um, Next to Sam is a, a fellow named Steve Higginbotham. Uh, Steve is a former state senator out in Arkansas. He is now the executive director of the Arkansas Wholesaler Beer Distributors Association. Uh, Steve, uh, a couple years back, sort of led a, a, a successful effort to ban price discrimination in Arkansas, and he's going to talk about this, uh, this, this effort because, you know, as we mentioned, the, the key battleground for a lot of these regulatory efforts is in the, at the state level, at the local level. Uh, and then uh, Sandeep Vahizen is a, res is a uh, 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 research fellow um, at the American Antitrust Institute here in Washington, and he's the author of the report I just mentioned. And um, he's going to uh, talk about this issue of whether, you know, what, from an antitrust lawyer's point of view, uh, is there should the government take action against to uh, prevent this proposed deal that would cement a complete control by ABI over the Mexican Grupo Modelo. So anyway, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Sam and, and uh, let Sam talk for about 10 minutes about um, his view of the beer, beer market. Okay, uh, yeah, I'm Sam, uh, president and founder of Dogfish Head Craft Brewery in Delaware. 
Um, also the chairman of the board of the Brewers Association, the trade group that uh, represents the vast majority of the small brewers in America, but I want to make it very clear that I'm here today with my dogfish head cap on. In fact, I got one for each of the uh, panelists over there. Um, uh, basically, we as small brewers at Dogfish Head support the current state-based regulation and a strong, independent, middle-tier uh, model for beer. Uh, it's about consumer choice. The fact that the craft brewing segment is growing is about uh, consumer power. Uh, it would not have happened if it weren't for consumer power. You know, our industry is only, as craft brewers, about 31 uh, years young, and it basically uh, came about uh, when Carter administration. Uh, reverse laws to make homebrewing legal. And, uh, you know, as a result of prohibition, the amount of consolidation by a few large brewers kind of took all the diversity and color out of the commercial brewing landscape uh, in America. Uh, Pre-prohibition, every city and every, every state had really unique, diverse uh, breweries that their beer kind of reflected the color of the people in that community. For example, example up the road in Philly, a lot of Ger German settlers, so they brewed awesome lagers. Further up the road in uh, New Amsterdam, what became New York, lots of Dutch and English setters, settlers, they brewed really beautiful ales. But post-prohibition, with all that consolidation, so much of that color uh, and diversity got drawn out of our, our industry, and it was the home brewers who then decided to turn their hobbies pro and open the small breweries that changed the direction. And it was the consumers who kind of had to fight through the difficulty in, in, in accessing those beers that made our movement less of a fad, and now it's recognized as a trend that's uh, going to be here for a long time. So this is about uh, consumer choice, and we want beer lovers to have access to the widest range of beers made by licensed brewers in all shapes and sizes. Uh, you know, the success or failure of a beer should depend on how great that beer is and what the beer drinker thinks of it instead of artificial restraints to distribution. And Dogfish Head's uh, poster boy example of that, I opened my brewery in my restaurant in 95, brewing 10 or 12 gallons in the corner of my restaurant. And the second year, I was wanted to get into distribution, started hand bottling my beer. And my first call was to the biggest distributor in the state, the Anheuser-Busch distributor. And in that era, it was the uh, around 97 or so, the 100% share of mind era. And it was a, literally a one sentence call. I'm sorry, we're not picking up any new brands. And to get to market, I went to a, a sort of third player in that marketplace. Um, and uh, since then, you know, we've grown from doing 100 barrels a year to this year we'll do about 171,000 barrels of beer. And, uh, you know, I have a little pub in Rehoboth, but besides that, 99% of the dogfish head beer sold. Uh, from coast to coast in like 26 states goes through independent distributors. Um, and we think that at Dogfish, you know, we believe state laws should support indie distribution and that, you know, it's not smothered by, by undue influence or ownership or control by the largest brewers so that we can ensure access to market for all brewers, uh, recently was uh, at the NBWA conference out west and meeting with our distributor from New York who was talking about a, a brewery that started as small as we did um, and uh, they decided they wanted to get into distribution. But what was nice is uh, in New York there's laws that allow small breweries up to a certain size to self-distribute. And that is a big issue for small brewers. Uh, there are, while we certainly believe in state level uh, wholeheartedly uh, lawmaking that affects us as small brewers, there are still challenges to navigate, one of which is the right to self-distribute, which we believe small brewers should have up to a, a percentage of business, uh, whether it's 20,000 barrels capped for that right, 200,000, 2 million, it should be up to the wholesalers and the, and the brewers in that state to figure that out. But in essence, this is like a, a a farm league uh, in baseball. When you think of the fact that you know the two big brewers that control the number you, you use was 90 percent, uh, and their distribution networks, and they have a growing level of influence on what's supposed to be an independent tier in terms of um, 
pressuring those distributors to prioritize their brands and their affiliates, it becomes very, very difficult for a craft brewer to get a legitimate distribution opportunity in, in a lot of markets around the country. And this right to self-distribute self kind of acts as a farm league, meaning the big brewery, the big distributors that might not want to spend their, their resources on a tiny little startup can allow that startup to prove itself kind of uh, economic Darwinism in their own local market and if they prove there's demand for their beer then that distributor once they see there's an opportunity for growth can work with that brewery and allow them to come into their portfolio well the challenge there is some states don't allow self-distribution but really the greater challenge is even those that do those independent distributors are receiving more pressure from the big breweries on prioritizing those brands. And that pressure kinds of, kind of uh, materializes in, in different ways. Uh, the 100% share of mind uh, program I mentioned from the late 90s has morphed into something called a, a anchor wholesaler uh, model that uh, the ABI uh, uses now, which has similar intentions in terms of uh, emphasizing their expectations that their distribution network will prioritize the brands that are either wholly owned or affiliated uh, with Anheuser-Busch. And the other uh, large brewery isn't uh, so different. They have uh, talked recently about the need for distributors um, to have a balanced portfolio. And that balance is really a euphemism for paying more attention to our brands and our affiliates than the craft brands uh, that in, are in your house. Um, the other issue besides uh, um, self-distribution that's facing us, uh, you know, at Dogfish, we, we've had this in our own state, is, you know, that small, small brewers and distributors should agree on contracts and legislation that are fair and equitable. Uh, we believe that where franchise laws exist, it should be up to the small brewers and the distributors in those states to decide uh, what is fair. But we also think there should be a, a carve out that if you're below a certain percentage of a distributor's business or a certain barrelage, you're exempt from those franchise laws. With the understanding that if your brand moves from one distributorship to another, fair market value should be paid. And it's not like the distributor just walks away. We know and we understand that distributors uh, contribute to a, a craft brewer's brand equity by by choosing to to carry our beers. So that's another big concern of ours. Um, another big big concern of, of, of ours at Dogfish Head um, is this potential uh, Modelo ABI deal. I'm not saying that we're 100% against it, just that we have uh, grave concerns that the results could be that distributors have less ability to bring independent craft brewers to market. And again, this goes back to uh, consumer access. Uh, when you think of the finite amount of, as a, re, as, a, as, a, as a consumer, you guys know there's a finite amount of shelf space uh, in a liquor store. There's a finite amount of tap handles at a good beer bar. You need to also know, and this isn't as transparent at the consumer level, that there's a finite amount of cubic feet on a beer delivery truck. And if uh, uh, the largest brewer is, is aligned with the largest importer and their, uh, their, their interest in brands overlaps in something like 80% of the distribution houses in America, it's very difficult for me to see a way that that doesn't uh, adversely affect small independent craft breweries' ability to get to market. Um, so as Dogfish Head, as a brewery, a family-owned company that's in the midst of a $52 million expansion, I have tremendous anxiety. Yes, there's demand for our beer today. The question is, will there be a market? Will we have access to market five, ten years from now, considering the direction uh, these challenges are going? Barry, I appreciate the opportunity to come today and uh, thank New America Foundation for sponsoring this. Uh, Barry uh, called me a few weeks ago and asked me to come up and talk a little bit about our uh, uniform FOB fight that we had in Arkansas four years ago. I've only been involved in this business six years and uh, it seemed like a sleepy, uh, sleepy little business uh, until I got involved in it and with uh, the major mergers of... Uh, Anheuser Busch and InBev and Miller Coors, the thing, the landscape began to change a little. But I'm here today not to 
not to talk bad about anybody. I, I got a call. I want to know what what are you what are you going up there for? What are you going to talk about? And uh, a little paranoia out there, I think. Uh, but uh, I'm here uh, not to talk about about big brewers, small brewers, or anyone. But basically to highlight my members who are independent beer distributors and their work on behalf of brewers, retailers, and consumers. Th what they do for their for the, for the beer industry. Arkansas has approximately 30 uh, different beer distribution uh, uh, outlets in Arkansas. We employ uh, uh, about 2,000 people uh, directly and uh, are, are, are through our, through associated with the distribution system. But nationally, the over 50 states, the beer wholesalers employ 130,000 people and they add $54 billion to the GDP of this country. Obviously, the beer business is big business. And these jobs that they provide are quality jobs. They provide good wages, they provide health care, and they, re they, they provide retirement. So protecting the independence of my members often, often expressed a different form of policy necessarily than the people that they distribute their beer for. Our partners, we have big partners, we have small partners. We have the, the mega uh, brewers and we've got the small brewers. And so many times our, our ideas conflict with their ideas. Arkansas, we had a uniform FOB fight and that is one example of how we had conflicts. The suppliers were able to discriminate in pricing to their own like wholesalers. My guys, the distributors, really didn't realize so much there was so much price discrepancy because they didn't really know what, what the pricing of the other, the other distributors were being sold to. But the retailer certainly picked up on it very quickly. So we had a, a situation where, like retailers who might be on a county line in different, different franchise areas, were paying as much as 2 and $3 more for a case of beer. And obviously, we had a lot of retailers who were, who were very, very, very unhappy. And they came to us and said, you know, we, we gotta, we've got we've to solve this problem because it's a severe disadvantage for me to have a, a liquor store across the street or just a few, few blocks down, and I'm paying $2 more for my beer. So when a su supplier discriminates in pricing and variable pricing among their own wholesalers, it creates an atmosphere where like wholesalers become competitors with each other. This business is competitive enough without you having to compete against your own product. The important points and results of our non-discriminatory legislation were it prevents a, a supplier from picking favorites. In other words, uh, a supplier can't come in, charge different prices to their wholesaler because that is a huge disadvantage. It can force uh, involuntary consolidation. As, uh, as Barry mentioned, there's, there's uh, that attitude out there of consolidating the wholesalers, but when you uh, price your beer at a different price to like wholesalers, it presents very, very, very big problems. Uh, with uniform FOB, basically, it, it prevents that. Also, uniform FOB, which is basically selling all your beer products to your like wholesalers at the same price also prevents reach back pricing and reach back pricing is sometimes very difficult to produce but if a if a wholesaler goes out and sells their beer for more than what their supplier feels like they should it's it was not uncommon for a supplier to reach back and say oh wait wait just a minute you got you got more than the recommended pricing to retailers so we're going to take a little piece of that pie back but in uniform FOB, the price is what you receive when it comes to your warehouse. So there's no, there's, there's no changing of that. I don't know of any businesses, hardly, franchise businesses particularly, that operate any differently from that. Uh, I, I think General, General Motors pretty well is going to sell their cars to their, their people pretty much the, the same price in, 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 a, in a certain territory or, or area. Uh, cars, trucks, insurance, McDonald's hamburgers, and we felt like beer should should be the same way and when i say independent beer distributors i'm not talking about breweries owning wholesalers the anheuser bush InBev uh branching that they have is illegal in arkansas 
It's, it's legal in some states, but it's illegal in Arkansas. And when, one, when the largest brewer in the world owns two tiers of the three-tier system, we feel like that, that's not appropriate. The Supreme Court has many times suggested and stated unquestionably that the three-tier system is the legitimate form of distribution in America. Independent distributors like ours are also, they're, they're part of their communities. They, they are reflections of their communities. Their members are local, they know their communities, and they can assist both state and local officials in preventing some of the worst kinds of abuses of alcohol. As we know, alcohol is a different product. It's not shampoo and it's not toothpaste. And unfortunately, there's some, some, some disadvantages in society when alcohol is abused. We are one of the few industries that spends money and discourages overconsumption of our product. And a lot of that comes every, every portion of a sale to, of a distributor goes to some form of responsible consumption of alcohol. Independent distributors may be united many times on policy, but believe me, it is a very, very, very competitive business. There are lots of brands out there that they are all vying to get that they want, they want to distribute. So they may agree generally in policy, but it's, it's, uh, it's a very, very, very competitive business. In fact, several of my members asked me to get Sam's card today because they're all interested in maybe getting uh, some of his beer down to Arkansas. He, he, get, he goes to Texas, but he doesn't quite get down to Arkansas. He forgot his card, so I'm going to be in trouble uh, when, when I get back. But uh, I, I, uh, I do think you might have a problem in Arkansas, Sam, because I think that uh, when you're Sam's Choice Beer, they're going to think it's Sam Walton's because uh, obviously uh, he's the best-known Sam in Arkansas, so uh, you may be second fiddle to, to, to Sam Walton there. Independent distributors, as well as most retailers and most suppliers, recognize that having a well-funded state regulator to enforce the laws related to retailers, distributors, and suppliers is very important. The Arkansas Uniform FOB Act that we brought forth, this issue would have never come to pass if it hadn't been from complaints about pricing in adjacent territories that was brought to our ABC regulator by the retailer. Just like the NFL has experienced this last fall, that uh, your referees need to be paid well and they need to be trained well. I think the alcohol industry needs to understand that making sure their alcohol referees are properly funded and trained. It is very important to have good regulations in every, all 50 states. We could have never passed uniform FOB if our ABC director had not been sitting in our legislative committees when the major suppliers came and denied that they were discriminating in their pricing. And when they, they denied that, it was a he said, she said deal. So he subpoenaed all of their pricing uh, information and uh, it, was, it, was, it was a blind deal. No one knew whose, whose prices were what. But when he subpoenaed that, that information, uh, the battle was virtually over because we, we proved we were, we were telling the truth. And uh, fortunately, we have a strong ABC regulatory uh, department in Arkansas. But the authority of the regulators is, is most important for them to keep independent all three tiers, your retailer, your distributor, and your supplier. All three of those tiers need to be separated and also, it needs to protect all three tiers from unfair trade practices such as non-discriminatory -discri pricing. The results of strong regulators in an industry are where the results of strong regulators are an industry where local family-owned liquor or convenience stores can compete on a level playing field with the Walmarts and the Costcos of the world. Can you imagine? how this industry would change and how devastating it would be if, uh, if, or if, if Anheuser-Busch and Miller Coors or any other breweries 
could discriminate in their pricing by pushing back the little guy and only catering to the big guy. That's, that's a scary, scary situation. It would be devastating to any small community. Distributor independence is by far the best policy for the beer consumer and the general public. Barry, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today, and thank you to the New America Foundation for organizing this interesting event. I'm Sandeep Bahisen from the American Antitrust Institute. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting competitive markets and the vitality of the antitrust laws. <clears throat> I'll be speaking about the big transaction that's currently pending in the U.S. beer industry. In late June, Anheuser-Busch InBev announced its intention to acquire the 50% of Grupo Modelo, Mexico's largest brewer that it currently doesn't own. At present, ABI owns a 50% non-voting interest in Modelo. ABI's brands include, among others, Budweiser, Bud Light, Stella Artois, and Bex. Modelo produces Corona and Modelo Especial, just to name a few. Along with being acquired by ABI, Modelo will sell its 50% interest in Crown imports to Constellation Brands, which currently owns the other 50% of Crown. Crown is the exclusive U.S. importer of Corona and other Modelo brands. Given the somewhat unusual structure of this transaction, there are two fundamental questions for the Department of Justice to analyze before it delves into the competitive effects. First, following the transaction, will ABI have a greater strategic interest in Modelo's brands? Or to put it more concretely, by swapping its indirect interest in Crown for a full interest in Modelo, will ABI capture a larger fraction of profits on every bottle of Corona sold in the United States? And secondly, will ABI have significant control of the point of sale marketing of Corona and other Modelo brands through the, cat through the category management process? For those of you who might not be familiar with category management, this is the practice under which retailers outsource particular product categories, typically to the leading or second leading manufacturer in a category. For example, Safeway may entrust ABI to manage its beer aisle or uh, Colgate to manage its toothpaste shelf. Given the American Antitrust Institute's exclusive reliance on public information, the analysis in our white paper is intended to be suggestive rather than definitive and exhaustive. Ultimately, there are many questions that only the DOJ with access to proprietary information, as well as a variety of industry stakeholders, can answer. With these caveats, we analyze the transaction assuming it amounts to a de facto merger between ABI's and Modelo's product portfolios and examine the possible competitive effects that may arise. At a national level, the two large brewers, ABI and SAB Miller, will increase their market share from 80% to 85%, and these are using somewhat conservative numbers. As Barry indicated, by other measures, their current market share may amount to 90%. Under the 2010 horizontal merger guidelines put out by the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission, this transaction is presumptively anti-competitive. An already highly concentrated market will become even more concentrated as a result of the transaction. In many local markets, these share numbers are likely to be even higher. For example, in Los Angeles, Miami, and other markets with large Latino populations, the sh shares of ABI and Modelo are probably even higher than they are at the national level. Multiple surveys have shown that Bud Light and Corona are the two most popular beers among Latino beer drinkers. In terms of competitive effects, the deal could lead to a significant loss of both price and non-price competition. Corona sales have thrived at a time when the beer industry on the whole has experienced stagnant sales growth. On account of Corona's success, ABI and SAB Miller have been forced to improve their own product portfolios. Most notably, in 2007, ABI launched Bud Light Lime as a direct head-to-head -head competitor with Corona, and this brand has done remarkably well over the past five years. <clears throat> Furthermore, Modelo is currently building the world's largest brewery along the Texas-Mexico border, the Piedras Negras facility. Just to give you a sense of its scale, when it's completed in 2013, this, beer will, this brewery will be large enough to meet 10% of annual U.S. beer consumption. Given its rapid sales growth in the U.S. over the past decade and its imminent capacity expansion, Modelo appears poised to remain a vigorous competitor in the beer market. If ABI acquires Modelo, an independently controlled brewer that has been a 
an important source of both price and non-price competition will be removed from the market. For instance, ABI will have less incentive to continue developing the Bud Light Lime brand. Any improvements in the sales of this brand will likely come at the expense of Corona, given that they're both in the same product <laughs> category. Furthermore, diminished price competition is also likely, with Piedras Negras being controlled by ABI instead of independent Modelo. In effect, ABI is trying to preemptively neutralize a disruptive facility. In addition to this reduction in horizontal head-to-head -head competition, the transaction could increase ABI's incentive and ability to exclude craft brewers from the market. Craft brewers, while still representing a small fraction of the market, have been in a rapidly growing segment in an otherwise stagnant beer market. <coughs> they have succeeded on account of their novel brews and higher quality ingredients. <coughs> because of the mandatory three-tier distribution system in nearly all states, brewers must use distributors to sell their beers to bars and retailers. As such, craft brewers, like all brewers, must have access to effective distribution channels. Due to ABI's larger market share following the transaction, it may have an increased ability and incentive to impose exclusive dealing on its distributors. That is, it could tell distributors in many local markets that they must carry only ABI brands if they want to remain with ABI. Given ABI's large market share, which will be even larger following the transaction, this is a credible threat to most distributors. ABI can use exclusive dealing to, prevent, to tie up the most efficient distributors and prevent them from carrying rival brands. If rivals cannot uh, access comparably efficient distribution, their beers may have greater difficulty in reaching bars and retail shelves, leading to reduced product choice for consumers. And this would come at an especially inopportune moment for American beer drinkers, a time when American beer is being hailed for its rich variety. In fact, The, the Economist magazine described the American beer industry as experiencing a renaissance. <clears throat> and the possibility of exclusivity over distribution is not merely a theoretical possibility. High-level executives at ABI have indicated that they strongly prefer that their distributors carry only their brands and not those of rivals. In 2011, ABI CEO Carlos Brito said that he was quote-unquote offended when he learned that one of its distributors had helped facilitate Yingling's entry into the Ohio market. And on a similar note, Dave Peacock, the former head of the Anheuser-Busch operations, endorsed the so-called anchor model of distri distributors and called for greater quote-unquote alignment between ABI and distributors. In Peacock's own words, aligned distributors would carry only brands, would only bring in brands that compete in segments underserved by our current portfolio. In theory, the underserved language offers an out for distributors who want to carry craft brands. In practice, though, it's really not that significant. With ABI's expansion into craft brands, through, for example, the launching of the Shock Top line or the acquisition of the Goose Island Brewery in Chicago, the number of segments underserved by ABI is steadily shrinking. As with many recent beer mergers, this merger is being premised on the notion of delivering significant consumer benefits in the medium and long term. Recent experience, however, suggests that me the mega mergers of the past five years have in fact hurt American beer drinkers. As with the current merger, the mega mergers of 2007 and 8 Miller Coors and AB InBev, respectively, promise significant consumer benefits through cost-saving efficiencies. In both, in both transactions, the parties claimed that they'd eventually generate several hundreds of millions of dollars worth of efficiencies that would ultimately be passed along to consumers. The empirical evidence, however, suggests that these lofty promises have not been borne out. Over the past five years, beer prices have risen at a time when beer sales have declined on account of the recession and continued sluggish growth in the job market. In contrast, the price of wine and spirits have remained fairly steady. Furthermore, the gross margins for ABI and Miller Coors have risen significantly at the same time. Although, take, although this does not con constitute conclusive evidence that these mergers have been anti-competitive, these facts taken together do suggest circumstantially <laughs> that recent mergers have harmed American beer drinkers. And it's worth emphasizing that when the DOJ evaluates its merger efficiencies, it takes a consumer-centric approach. It does not merely look for efficiencies to enhance the bottom lines of the merging parties. Instead, merger efficiencies must offset any anti-competitive harms flowing to consumers. And in the case of the recent mega-mergers, any efficiencies arising from them haven't offset the harm to consumers by all public accounts. Given this recent history, ABI and Modelo should have the burden of showing a skeptical agency and public why this transaction is different. Thus far, I've spoken in terms of probabilities. 
not certainties. And, and it's worth remembering that probabilities are the hallmark of merger enforcement. Merger enforcement, by its very nature, is a predictive enterprise. The Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission will try to examine how a merger is likely to affect competition in the future. Certainty and definitiveness are not possible. Furthermore, Section 7 of the Clayton Act, the relevant statutory provision reads that it prohibits transactions whose effect, quote, may be substantially to lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. The word may is significant. It doesn't indicate will substantially lessen competition or tend to create monopoly, simply <coughs> may. For the reasons I've discussed, this transaction appears likely to reduce competition. In addition, it seems to tend to create a monopoly. A series of transactions have left the U.S. beer industry with two dominant players, ABI and SAB Miller. And even though ABI has not completed its acquisition of Modelo, speculation has already begun that ABI will next seek to acquire SAB Miller and establish a de facto monopoly in U.S. beer. As with many contentious mergers, the parties will seek to obtain DOJ approval by proposing certain structural remedies, for example, di divesting certain facilities or brands. In the beer market, it's worth remembering, though, that the identities of the remaining market players will matter just as much as their market shares. A divestiture of one or multiple ABI brands could preserve existing market shares in national and local markets, but such remedy is unlikely to replace the loss of an independently controlled Modelo in brands like Corona. If the DOJ finds through its investigation that the proposed acquisition is likely to lead to the described anti-competitive effects, it should seek to enjoin the deal in court to preserve a beer market that delivers both competitive prices and rich variety and halt the industry's march to monopoly. Barry stole my thunder earlier by quoting Justice Black's famous words in the United States versus Pabst Brewing Company, but I think it's worth reiterating just because his prescience is quite revealing and it's still not too late for the Department of Justice to heed his words. Justice Black, writing for the majority, wrote, if not stopped, this decline in the number of separate competitors and this rise in the share of the market controlled by the larger beer manufacturers are bound to lead to greater and greater concentration of the beer industry into fewer and fewer hands. Well, that was great. Um, I want to thank all three of you for those uh, presentations. And um, uh, in a moment, we're going to, uh, actually, I'm going to sort of take advantage of my position in the front of the room and ask each of these guys a question. But then we're going to open it up and allow uh, uh, folks in the audience to ask questions of anybody up here. Uh, before I do that, I just actually, there's something I should have mentioned before, uh, which is that this event is, uh, a co-sponsor of this event is the Washington Monthly. Uh, it's a a partner, a uh, close partner of ours and a, a, a lot of the work that we do uh, here at New America. And um, they were the publishers, as I mentioned before, of uh, Tim Heffernan's recent article. I uh, also wanted to note the presence here of uh, Bernie Asher, who's down here in the uh, front row. Uh, Bernie uh, wrote a, um, uh, a study of the uh, very detailed study of the history of the American uh, market for, for beer, uh, for the, uh, also for the American Antitrust Institute. You can find that on the um, American Antitrust Institute uh, website. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to sort of uh, do a couple of quick questions, and I'm going to actually start with uh, Sandeep, and I just want to make sure that um, we're absolutely clear. I mean, uh, you recommend in your essentially in your paper, or in the AAI, American Antitrust Institute, is recommending that the deal, the proposed deal, be blocked. That's correct. Uh, we propose that the DOJ should block the transaction, provided that their investigation reaches the same conclusions that we do. Of course, given their superior access to information and industry stakeholders, they may find that the transaction doesn't lead to the anti-competitive effects we describe. So I would offer that qualifier. And then would you, or you know, either you individually or the AAI, uh, if you're in a position to speak for them, um, for, uh, say that there might be sufficient reason to actually roll back the amount of concentration that is in the market at this point? I guess in theory, 
there would be a good case to be made for that given how recent mergers have played out. But in practice, the agencies, whether it's the Federal Trade Commission or the Department of Justice, very rarely challenge mergers once they've been consummated. So as a practical matter, it probably wouldn't mean much to recommend rolling back uh, recent consolidation in the industry. Okay. And actually, this is for uh, Steve. And, uh, you know, Steve talked a lot about something that is very, very important, which is price discrimination. And you know, in our work at New America, uh, the Markets Enterprise and Resiliency uh, Initiative at New America, we've done a lot of work looking at price discrimination. And this is where either a producer charges retailers, distributors different prices for the exact same product, or it could be when someone controls access to a market where they pay the producers that are under its power different prices for more or less the same product. We actually had a, a recent paper by our colleague Lena Khan. There's actually an article in the Washington Monthly that looked at price discrimination, various forms of discrimination among the people who bring chickens to market, where you have very large, powerful companies, uh, Pilgrim's Pride, for instance, Tyson's, that pay farmers different amounts of money for the same quality, same pound of chicken flesh. And actually, just wanted to sort of say, uh, use that as a setup for uh, Steve. And do, politically, what is the political importance, not just the economic importance, but the political importance of very large companies being able to sell one pro the same product to one company at one price and a different company at a different price? Well, it's uh, any time they do that, they, they're, they're dictating who's, who's going to, uh, they're picking ch favorites. And you pick favorites, and so they're those that you pick favorites are going to be successful. So that's, uh, that was our concern is in, in the beer business was they had certain wholesalers, they were charging less and certain more, so it was basically, uh, we all know that you can have forced consolidation because you can literally price anybody out of business when you, their livelihood is your product. And are they able to sort of uh, uh, gain friends for whatever they're promoting? Well, I doing? call it picking, picking favorites, and uh, obviously that, that's the end result. And, um, and then, Sam, just a, a quick question, and this is just to get you in trouble with your colleagues in the brewing industry. Um, are there, among your sort of the other brewers, the small craft brewers, um, are there a couple that you really favor? <laughs> um, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a beer geek. I'm not a beer snob. Uh, and uh, so it's usually whatever beer I'm drinking when somebody asks me that. And since I'm having water, I guess I don't have a, a good answer other than to say I, I, uh, I try to support other uh, independent uh, small craft breweries when I'm, when I'm drinking uh, beers that aren't, aren't dogfish. And, um, you know, th and going back to your comments about sort of the role of the... Um the distributors and what you know how they sort of help out small players you know we've done a lot of work uh, that looks at the book industry and publishers a lot of people there's a couple of very large powerful really one extremely powerful company that's uh, trying to squash the publish publishing industry in this country um, and um, as a writer I know that publishers play an extremely important role. These middlemen within the system play an extremely important role, um, helping to capitalize projects, helping to groom projects, books, uh, helping to uh, uh, ensure that a really good book gets to market and is treated uh, uh, with as much respect as it deserves in the market. And you know, looking at the distributors, um, you know, they, to me, they look a lot like they do a lot of the same activities as publishers. I mean, they do things that if you're trying to get into Arkansas, you could, really couldn't do it without Steve. I mean, because Steve's got trucks. Steve has refrigerators. And, I mean, it's, it provides services that um, you rely on 
to get to market. I just want to, um, I mean, could you imagine a way to grow your product without this kind of support from the middlemen? You know, I, I can't because, you know, the uh, craft brewing industry, unlike, say, software industry where you come up with an awesome idea and it's you can just exponentially grow it, brewing industry is, is incredibly uh, bricks and mortar intensive and the investments that we have to make in stainless steel and in bottling uh, uh, capacity, you know, eats so much of our profitability that's left over after excise taxes and payroll and, and labor that to then have to fund also trucks and logistics and, uh, um, you know, forklifts and routes and additional labor to get to market, that's not our strength as small brewers. That said, oftentimes very small brewers don't have choices in distribution and that self-distribution model allows them to get their feet underneath them until they prove they're a viable uh, uh, business, at which point the marketplace should take care of that and provide them opportunities to, to go into distribution. And again, that's a big concern of ours because while it should provide that opportunity, the two dominant brewers are, are, are putting more and more pressure on the independent distributors uh, to, uh, to not be as welcoming to the small brewers and I want to st state clearly I'm not uh, there I, I, I want to see the big brewers right the ship on on their their flagship light loggers uh, being stagnant or, 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 or not not growing and I want to see beer stop losing market share to spirits and uh, to wine but I just think we're in a totally, frankly, different industry than those those big breweries are. It's, there's 2,200 of us, and it's interesting that while we are relatively successful, only one craft brewery is, is public, and that's Boston Beer. And that's a little bit of a unique situation because Jim controls the, the voting stock, so he can still make decisions with his brewer's hat on instead of the max, <laughs> maximizing shareholder value every quarter decision-making that goes into uh, – uh, effect with the biggest public companies, and I think oftentimes with that short sight, uh, the 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 opportunities for entrepreneurs gets marginalized very quickly. And actually, yeah, uh, and actually, if you could just say who you are and introduce yourself. Cool. Thanks. Uh, uh, so thank you much for organizing this. Uh, hi, um, I, I'm Clark, uh, and um, I, I guess I'll self-identify uh, as a uh, as a beer advocate and as a consumer. Uh, so thank you, Sam, for all of your work. I'm a huge fan of Dogfish Head um, uh, and the work that you guys do. I want to ask you a kind of similar question that was just posed by the moderator. Um, I'm having a hard time kind of jiving your narrative of the past, you know, 80 years, and you know your own history with your company with the importance of this state-mandated three-tier distribution system. While I get the answer you just gave to his last question about it being important to help get beer to a place you couldn't otherwise get it to, it seems like a real impediment to me as a beer consumer. I want to drink the best beer I can at the cheapest price I can, and I want to be as close to the beer producers as I can be. Uh, in uh, my home state of Michigan, we don't have a lot of diversity in our beer selection, especially around Detroit, where I'm from. I would talk to retailers, I'm like, can you get some dogfish head? They don't even know what I'm talking about. Because it seems to me like it's an impediment to put this artificial middleman in between the consumer, the retailer, then the middleman, then the producers. I can see why there might be a use for the for the kind of beer distributor, you know, if you guys get your beer across the country, but I don't see this kind of need for this state mandated system where the small guys who are trying to get a startup of a product they're passionate about, they want to get to consumers, they have to kind of work their way through this very politicized three tier system, which, you know, is very politicized. I also spent some time in Lansing working in the state legislature. Um, a guy I was working for tried to introduce a bill to reform the three-tier system, and the three-tier system dumped money on him to destroy his campaign. Um, so, again, just all these impediments to the little guys getting their beer to the consumers. Uh, I, I, and if you can talk to that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, like, like I said, I feel it's really important for a small brewery to have access to market. And... Oftentimes, that means self-distribution, and that model is very difficult to take around the country by virtue of how small we are. So oftentimes, it usually means within your own state, and it's a starting point. But if you look at the, you look at the pressures if there was no three-tier system, and you look at sort of that Costco scenario and where that could be, frankly, if that 
if that model took took effect, I really think it'd be game over for craft brewing in America. <laughs> Very quickly, you'd get into you know a, a Wal Walmart uh, similar situation. I think where you'd just have you know one player delivering beer with one percent margin on top of it and the uh, retailer selling that for one percent margin on top of that until they obliterated all competition and then where would pricing be and then would where would the marketplace be so you know for us the smaller guys without three-tier distribution it's a really scary picture steve you want to add anything to that well uh when you when you start trying to distribute outside of a small parochial area you get, it becomes very difficult but uh you, the the three tier system has proven a separation of control and which is which is sorely needed and uh, I, I we have a, in Arkansas we allow craft brewers to have small self distribution but uh, the owner of that company told me very quickly when he gets outside of a, a metropolitan area it just not economically feasible for him to to go without a distributor. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm David Balto. I'm an antitrust lawyer. Sam, um, when the Justice Department looks at mergers like this, oftentimes they require just the divestiture of a brand. Um, would you be satisfied or would other craft brewers be satisfied if the Justice Department solution was just the divestiture of something like Bud Light Lime? And as an alternative, <coughs> thinking about your distribution concerns and some of the things Sandeep mentioned, would your concerns be you know, alleviated or better addressed if there was a prohibition on exclusivity or a prohibition on Anheuser-Busch owning, uh, building its strength and distribution? Yeah, I mean, personally, I don't think I have the perspective to uh, speak to exactly what the DOJ's decision should be, and neither am I sitting up here uh, saying that I adamantly think the deal shouldn't go through. I will say that as a small brewer, I have very deep concerns with it as it's written and as I understand it, uh, particularly when uh, a brand like Corona sells at roughly craft uh, retail prices. And again, what does that mean for the finite amount of shelf space uh, for small brewers? And also, frankly, yes, the, the, the uh, proliferation of branch ownership is I extremely daunting from a small brewer's perspective. Um, you know, right now I believe ABI controls 50% of their own distribution, and yet we're all talking about how wonderful it is to have an independent middle tier. How really independent is that? Um, and so that, too, to me, looks uh, threatening in our future. So I can't suggest a remedy uh, with, the, with the perspective that they'll need to make their decisions. I'm only voicing concerns. And Sandeep, do you have a... Yeah, as I mentioned in my remarks, I think in a divestiture, the, and especially in a market like beer, the identities of the independent players matters just as much as the particular share numbers. So the DOJ could accept a remedy whereby current market shares are preserved in, all, in the national market as well as all affected local markets, but it would still raise the question of Will these divested brands be able to replace Corona? And given Corona's recent history, I'd, I'd be very skeptical. Okay, right next to David uh, is... Hi, Paul. Paul Glazer speaking. Um, Steve, uh, you mentioned many of your constituents of the 30 wholesalers wanted to give their cards to, uh, to Mr. Colangion. Um Most of them? All of them? More, more or less half of them. And the other half uh, would be afraid, or are they anchor brewers, or would they be they're, offending uh, their uh, one of the big two? Well, your, your uh, SAB Miller Coors distributors have a lot of craft beers. Our, our ABI uh, guys don't have much craft beer. So it doesn't sound like there's any issue with getting distribution in Arkansas. As your so, issue would be in other states where it, I, I hear the, the situation where uh, ABI owns half their distribution system. Yeah, and again, there are some great 
we're with some Anheuser-Busch houses, so it's not just a black and white or blue and red uh, discussion. Uh, there are a number of ABI houses that have t told uh, the corporate folks at ABI, thanks for the recommendation on how I should run my business, but I'm going to make my own choices and bring the, own, the brands that I believe in into my fold. And there are awesome examples of that in the blue network as there are in the red network. So not being in Arkansas, I can't speak to what our options would be there, but you know, the other thing, I, I realize Dogfish is very lucky. We're the, now the 13th largest craft brewery in the country, and to some extent, our, our, our reputation is even bigger than our sales, and I feel very fortunate for that. You know, but I also re remember that the average size craft brewery in America is a 5,000-barrel brewery, and what would their opportunities look like without having the profile that Dogfish has if they were to go into Arkansas? Sandeep, would the Arkansas uh, model work in the rest of the country, then? Uh, in, in terms of Miller independence of the uh, distributors from the big two. I, I guess one thing I'll say is each market is going to be very unique. The DOJ will have to study Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Little Rock on their own because the distribution patterns vary from market to market. As Sam <laughs> said, it's not black black and white. Um, so I as to the independent dis distribution question, uh, I'm sort of agnostic on whether it promotes or hinders the growth of craft brewers. I s learned enough about the three-tier distribution system to write this paper, but not enough to comment on the merits of the system as a whole. Actually, just one comment, because we did write uh, in the paper that we uh, are putting out today, we spent a lot of time looking at sort of the relationship between the very power uh, companies like ABI and Miller Coors and the distributors. And it's important to understand it's not a static situation. You know, what, what exists today, even if it's still working at some level, is not necessarily going to be what exists tomorrow. And, um, and one of the, you know, like last year, just for instance, um, I guess it was late 2011, I may be wrong in my details, um, ABI put out what they call the consolidation guide. And they sent this out to their distributors, and they basically said, and you can read more about it in our report, um, you guys, there's going to be fewer of you in the future. And you're going to have to figure out how to do two things, uh, uh, merge with each other and uh, you know, compete with each other and figure out uh, who, who's going to end up on top in this kind of game of musical chairs. And uh, you're going to have to... Um, figure out how to align yourselves even better than you already are with us. And that means making sure that to a greater degree than you do now, you're not carrying any sort of competi competing products. So anyway, that's uh, what we're looking at. You know, what we could see two years, five years from now could be a much less uh, sort of robust system than we have now, and the system today is much less robust than it should be. Actually, all right. Oh. Hi, um, is this working? I'm a Bernard L. Schwartz Fellow here at New America. I cover U.S.-Mexico relations. I'm originally from Canada, and uh, I want to preface this a couple of points and get your comments on them. Not so much about the Canadian model, but about the practices of the beer companies. Many years ago, uh, Coors came in, took over Molson, and Interbrew came over and took over Labatt's. And some very interesting things happened over the, year, over the years. The Canadian brands that were presented by Molson and Labatt's were trumped by the brands that the corporations who came in and took over came in, and the quality of the beer went down. Now, I preface everything I'm going to say is I love beer. I love beer a lot. I travel all over Europe. I'll go to a bar with a microbrewery just to try their beer. The next thing that happened is you'd go into a bar and you'd say, hey, can I have a whatever brand? They say, sorry. The bartender would say, we only carry Labatt's products. We only carry Molson products. So you couldn't get that beer at that bar anymore because the corporation would come in and say, hey, we're going to give you a distribution deal. These are all the beers we brew. And if you do a deal with us and only carry our stuff, we're going to give you a special price. And that's the way the bartenders explained it to me. So I wonder if you could talk about those practices and what your thoughts are on that. Uh, does anyone want to comment or I can comment? 
Do that. Go for it, Sam. Um, you know, I would just say what you're talking about is, is generally referred to globally as sort of tied house scenarios where the retailer is to some degree uh, indebted or aligned with a, a particular supplier if it's an industry that doesn't mandate middle tier distribution or with a distributor. And that too is something that is regulated or exists with different uh, realities on a state by state basis. Oftentimes what a brewery like ours will come up against is yes, XYZ chain wants to do business with us, but they mandate that we uh, uh, underwrite the, the payment for their menu system, or we pay for uh, airplane poles up and down the beach, or we pay for uh, 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 umbrellas out in their deck. And then if it's legal, it just becomes a reality of who has deeper pockets. So I guess I can't fault the largest breweries for playing that game in the states where it's legal. Uh, do I wish those games weren't legal to be played? Of, of course I do. Uh, but I don't know, you know, I don't know how the UK is faring any different where uh, so much of the, the Tidehouse laws have been eroded. I do know there is a burgeoning craft beer uh, scene there, so I'll stay hopeful. In red, did you? Yeah. Hi. Okay, sorry. Michelle Minton from uh, the Competitive Enterprise Institute. So I challenged that last person who just spoke to go back to Canada now and look at the look at the bars that you can go into. Is there more craft beer on tap now than there's ever been any time ever? If you look at DC, for example, in the last five years, it's just it's booming. And I know that's not the same all over the country, but this is happening even as the two biggest suppliers, the brewers, are dominating the market by all accounts, 80, 90 percent, whatever it is, but the craft beer movement is still picking up steam. The demand is there. So I feel like saying that the two big breweries getting even bigger and having more power over the middle tier or even muddling the middle, the, the three-tiered system is a threat. Um, I think if we allow craft brewers more opportunities to become distributors themselves, uh, clearly the demand is there. Let's say AB does tell their uh, distributors that they can only distribute theirs. For one thing, they're independent distributors, they can say no. The demand for craft beer is there if they're smart, like apparently uh, Sab Miller is. They'll keep craft beer as part of their portfolio. So just, I don't see why the large brewers getting bigger is such a threat. If we allow small brewers more liberty, that should allow for the market demand to just take take over. Can I, I'll comment real quickly on that one because uh, it's something pretty fresh in my mind. I was reading one of the beer uh, trade publications recently where an executive for the uh, for the business unit, 100% uh, owned by Miller Coors, that uh, plays in the in the same uh, category that Kraft exists in, gave an interview where he told Kraft brewers, uh, "We come in peace." Uh, when there was some anxiety about Miller Coors uh, pressuring their distributors to focus on their either wholly owned or partially owned brands, and then a few weeks later, that same executive was on a stage and said that his goal was to own the high end of beer, the craft category. And to me, th those two ideals don't jibe. So while they might say they're coming from an altruistic perspective and just want to see all craft grow, there's a difference between all craft and uh, or, or what we call real craft, frankly, and fake craft. And the idea of a blue moon or a, a shock top having the same access to market issues that we do, the same access to ingredient issues that we do, is just a completely unlevel playing field. Uh, so it is, you know, it is, it is a reality. I'd like to respond to that comment as well. As Barry mentioned at the opening, I think it is possible to sometimes overstate the significance of craft brands, given how so many of the craft brands are actually made by one of the big two, Shock Top and Blue Moon, for example. So there's that to bear in mind. And in addition, the success of the craft brands is dependent on distribution remaining open and available to craft brands, and also the big two not manipulating the category management process to keep craft brands off retail shelves. So. The, the power of the big two shouldn't be understated. And just to put it somewhat more concretely, if a <laughs> distributor has to choose between carrying ABI brands and craft brands, it's a no-brainer. The volume of 
ABI brands just completely uh, dwarf the volume of craft brands. And so just because a distributor may have personal preferences doesn't mean anything. The economic incentives often force them to favor the big two over the craft brands. So quickly respond yeah. to that. If that happens, then there's a vacuum in the distribution market. Then there's nobody distributing craft beer. And since there's such clearly demand for that, one would think that some other distributor would come up and say, well, you know, I'll just distribute craft. It, yeah, we're, when we're seeing that in Arkansas, but you're also, you, you said market share, and it's all about if, 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 the, if that brand it can, can get some market share if it's real quality. But we're seeing independent craft distributors right now that just come into our association handling nothing but craft beers. And also, we're seeing our ABI, some of our ABI wholesalers over the last three years have realized the market share, and so they have uh, gone non-exclusive. So we're about half non-exclusive now and half exclusive in the ABI side. The Miller side is, is all, you know, non-exclusive. I would also say that, just to quickly add, um, when the antitrust agencies are looking at particular transactions, they also have to deal with market realities. I agree, it's possible what you predict could come true, but that's merely a theoretical possibility. And so the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission have to take into account how likely that is to happen. <coughs> Hey, we have about uh, five more minutes, so let's um, get a few more questions. Hi. Um, I guess I'm having the same. There's a microphone. Okay. I'm Jake Hasselsword. I'm in the political science department at uh, George Washington University. Um, I'm also a beer lover, so I, uh, my wife and I visited Sam's Brewery for our fifth anniversary, so I can establish my <laughs> beer geek uh, credentials. And I, I've even done a little sporadic home brewing. So um, definitely my, my interest here is also in, in consumer choice. But if I take a step back and I just put on sort of a, the hat of someone who studies policy and, and, and political economy, regardless of, of what the product is, um, the federalism angle of this, I, I was thumbing through the report, and there was a lot of praise for the 21st Amendment solution of having a lot of state and local control over this. My perspective is, if you take a product that is heavily regulated, you know, at pretty much every stage, and there's a lot of licensing and taxes and rules over who can sell what where, and you say, we're going to put control of that at the state and local level, I'd say that's a recipe for rent-seeking, for businesses capturing and using these tools of government to, you know, to, for anti-competitive practices. And so, for me, that would be part of the star story of how we got here. And when I read, you know, at the end of the report that the solution is to sort of reinvigorate uh, regulation at the, at the state, local, and federal level, I don't know that I have a lot of faith in that. I think I would probably, this to me sounds like something that probably should be handled more at the national level, where you have a larger scope of conflict, so to speak, and uh, institutions that are more capable of standing up to entrenched interests like these sort of increasingly large uh, entrenched interests. So I guess that's more of a comment than anyone can well, respond to. Does anyone want to comment on the comment? Or? Well, I know, I know the people of Arkansas have different values to, or, or thoughts toward alcohol than, say, someone up in the north or, say, in New York, California. So I think each individual state, uh, they, <coughs> states want to regulate how alcohol is handled in their state. And just like in Arkansas, about 40% of the geographic area is dry. I mean, you know, we got this great diversity where the whole east side of the state's wet, and then the middle portion, kind of the Bible Belt there, <laughs> is, is dry. And now we're seeing a trend to where everything's beginning to go wet. But I, I think states' rights, uh, states like to be able to control the norms of how alcohol is consumed. You know, just as a sort of add to that, I mean, I think that there's a, you know, just from our own work, um, you know, I don't think you can set up any marketplace, whether it's regulated at the state level, local level, or national level, or global level, where you don't have rent seeking. I mean, it's just it's just part of life. That's the way people are. And um, you know, the key thing I think with this, and we'll hear more of this on the on the second panel, is that the, you know the state level regulation and the three tier structure. One of the main reasons is precisely to allow, because this is not, as we said before, it's not an ordinary commodity is to allow to make sure that power is distributed sufficiently so that the local community has the ability when necessary to get into the marketplace and do what it desires to do. 
Um, and when, when the uh, local community does that, it's really just affecting thus the community. It's not affecting the national landscape. What's done in Arkansas is not affecting what happens in California. Um, so I think, you know, it's like the, the purpose of this was not efficiency. It wasn't to, uh, um, it wasn't to ensure that we, um, you know, had the cheapest beer. Um, but one of the outcomes, one of the secondary effects of this is, we, we, uh, is this incredibly wide variety of beer. Okay, we, maybe we have two more questions. All right, Zon. Um, my name is Phil Peters. I, I am the general manager at Smith Commons, and I also order the beer. We're a craft beer establishment. So clearly, from my standpoint, I'm always trying to put on what is the highest rated beer advocate, ratebeer.com type, type beers. The argument that's been, I guess, given to me with this AB and Bev Goose Island thing is it's really for a wider distribution and implanting their year-round brands, say 312, to get a wider distribution of that and then therefore opening up the ability to do more of the craftier barrel-aged stuff as in like the Bourbon County Stouts and stuff like that and creating a wider distribution for that, therefore getting a better beer out there. So from my standpoint as an account, I see that's great. I'm going to be able to get this great beer in and people are going to want to come to Smith Commons and have this beer, but therefore I'm supporting that aspect of things. What's difficult for me on my level of things is to have the consumer, like you were saying, where we see craft beer growing and we see the consumption of craft beer and educating that craft beer to the point where people are consuming more of it, to end up in a situation where it's not, you know, you're not, you're not getting the full support from all of those craft breweries like, like we're talking about here. So how is it for me as an account in this three-tier system being on the bottom, am I going to be in a situation where I'm f able to support what we're talking about now, but still putting, putting the best beer that I possibly can on because now there's an increased distribution from like a Goose Island, for example. And then the other kind of aspect of this is where does the Brewers Association, and obviously with CBC coming up in the spring and whatnot, at some point in time, the Brewers Association and the craft beer community has got to educate the consumer on this kind of conversation to kind of find our direction as to where the consumer is eventually going to go to either they're going to continue to support the AB InBev craft beer you know, stuff or they're going to start to slide themselves away from it and support more of the smaller guys as we talk about. You know what I mean? And, and that's going to ultimately that supply and demand is going to be what's going to drive this greater argument for what we're talking about now and then ultimately for me as an account is the direction that I'm eventually going to go. So where is the Brewers Association at this point in time kind of staying on it? And at some point in time, I guess down the road here, as craft beer continues to grow and the Brewers Association says, here's the parameter that defines craft beer, mm -hmm. at some point in time, are we going to say that we're getting larger and larger? Now where do we go? What's the next step to really be competitive with this? Sam, you want to handle that? Or? Yeah, the, the, cra the Brewers Association does have a definition of a craft brewery, and it's small, independent, <coughs> traditional. Small being less than 6 million barrels, traditional meaning their, their uh, core brands are made with all malt, not corner rice, and independent, meaning less than 25% owned by one of the large breweries. So in the example that you gave of Goose Island, that would fall most definitively outside of our definition. And, you know, with that definition or with other breweries like Kona or Red Hook that fall outside that definition, some great brewers work at these breweries, some talented brewers, some passionate beer people work there. But, you know, when you made the example of, okay, well, by being 100% owned by Anheuser-Busch, it means that they can make more of their core brands around the world, and then, you know, that leads to them more of their specialties being out there. But if you play that argument to the extreme, and you know that a ABI's recent meeting, they said to their distributors, their goal is to have Goose Island be a million barrel brand, I think, within three years. And you put that in the context of them also telling their distributors, you need to focus more on the brands we own and we're affiliated with. They only have so many resources and so many eyes, which means if that's a mandate that could, if they don't hit it, they make it consolidated by the guy who did, that's an Anheuser-Busch distributor. That means they're going to focus on Goose Island instead of those independent smaller breweries in their house. So while there's no, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with the people that work there and there's some passionate beer people, the way that these once independent 
breweries will be used by these big breweries will further their goal of demanding more and more of their distributors uh, share of mine. I just want to ask one question is uh, has anyone had their hand up who is actually from uh, the industry from ABI from from Miller Coors who we didn't uh, uh, call on if uh, we're going to move on to the next panel but I just want to make sure that we're not leaving anyone out and especially from the industry. I'll take that. Uh, one concern with the transaction as it's currently structured is that Crown will control marketing for Corona and other Modelo brands, but the interests of Crown and ABI will still be very much aligned because Crown will be dependent on ABI to obtain beer. And so insofar as um, Crown succeeds, it also means that ABI is selling more beer to Crown. And since their interests will remain intertwined, ABI, for example, might have less of an incentive to target Corona through Bud Light Lime or new brands than it would if Corona were still an independently controlled brand. So I do think there are problems with the current transaction because the incentives are not really independent. Okay. The, su the supply agreement ensures that Crown will have enough beer to maintain Corona as a, as a vital brand. But the problem is, for every bottle of cor Corona that Crown sells, ABI is selling more beer to Crown. So ABI doesn't have much of an incentive to directly target Corona because that'll, it'll be shooting itself in the foot. And until you have the clear independence between the two companies, you'll have, you, you will have serious competitive effects resulting. Okay, so we're going to move on. Uh, we're going to have a little break. We have coffee, I believe, out there and maybe some cookies. Um, and then in about 10 minutes, we're going to have the second panel. Uh, but anyway, I just think we should say thanks to these panelists who are... So.